Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the proposal and acceptance is what I've titled this in chapter 19. This is the moment really when the people of God uh, have reached Mount Sinai. Moses was here over a year ago. At the time he was herding sheep, now he's herding people. A much worse flock, you know, much less complaint, I suppose, than the sheep had been. Nevertheless, uh, the people are back at this point and a lot has happened since he was last here. But this is it. This is really the reason God brought them out. He brought them out to bring them to this point where now he's going to propose to them. And in many ways, this chapter is God's proposal and the people of God are given the opportunity to respond back to God. And that marriage motif really runs through the Old Testament where God allows himself to be described as their husband and, this, and they his wife. And this marriage, of course, gives rise to a whole <clears throat> a lot of uh, texture of the Old Testament, largely because the wife turns out to be so unfaithful. So we have a lot of accusation of spiritual unfaithfulness and adultery, and so unconnected to the idea is there this idea of marriage uh, that has been entered into between God and his people. And of course, this is it. This is the point where we have, in a sense, the marriage ceremony, at least the beginnings of it. So this chapter is quite important. Chapter 20, as you know, is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And the next chapters deal with the law and the giving uh, God is giving to his people and entrusting them. As Paul says, of course, in his oracles, uh, the great treasure, you might say, is that God gives to his people. That becomes a light not only to Israel, but for all the rest of history. So it's a rather significant chapter for that very reason. And I have to say, first of all, the first half of Exodus is a whole lot more fun than the last half. The last half gets into somewhat technical details, you know, such as the building of the tabernacle, and it's often neglected. But you don't have so quite so many wonderful engaging accounts uh, that can really ascend the drama of the text that we have uh, in the first chapters of Exodus. So we're in Exodus chapter 19. We'll take it a paragraph at a time as usual, starting with verse 1, and this is the word of God. On the third new moon, after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the very day came, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, Tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So there's our initial text, and let's of course ask God's blessing on our reflection of it. Great God in heaven, we're grateful to you once again as the story continues to unfold, that we can see things that you did with your people so many years ago that have shaped the world in which we live and the wonderful heritage that we enjoy today. We pray that as we reflect on this uh, great text, that you would instruct us in the great truth, even as your people of the old were married to you in this covenant. And that we've been called the bride of Christ in the new covenant. And we would learn the lessons that are here for us. And we're asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So in the third mood, in the third month after they'd gone out of the land of Egypt. So a lot has happened in three months since Passover. It seems like longer than that, doesn't it? And we have all these adventures, you know, like the Exodus uh, crossing, the various lessons that they've learned on the way. We've reviewed, of course, this the last several times, and they've learned that it, you know, <clears throat> that God is the God who heals, God who gives food, God who gives strength. They learned that at Rephidim, uh, when the rock was struck and the water pours out. It's God who defends. They learned that with the battle with Amalek and all the preparatory things that were required to teach them the adequacy of the one who's going to now do this proposal to them. This is intended to instruct them uh, that this is the one God who is sufficient for them. 
Now the question is going to be put to them. Will you have this Yahweh? God is your God. And so they've come to this place now, here called Sinai, as we've talked about before. Of course, I won't go into this again in detail, but very probably the location of Mount Sinai, which is not known for sure, but it is not in the Sinai Peninsula, probably somewhere in what we would call modern day Saudi Arabia, probably north of the Red Sea Crossing site there. And that's probably the location, but we spent other sessions uh, looking on that. <clears throat> they journeyed to Rephidim into the wilderness of Sinai, camped in the wilderness, uh, camped in the wilderness, Israel camped in front of the mountain here now. And so here they are back at this place. God said to Moses earlier, uh, it'll be a sign to you that you'll bring these people back here. And I think probably your, uh, Moses remembered that statement and thought to himself, well, you know, who do, who to thunk that? <sighs> here we are just as God had predicted and indeed commanded. And now all of these things have been brought to great fruition. Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain saying you shall say to the house of Jacob this is the first of several occasions which Moses is going to be shuttling up to the top of the mountain and back and even in this chapter we're going to see that he does that several times Moses's style uh, is at that of the great mediator that's what a mediator does it's someone who goes back and forth between two parties in some kind of negotiating capacity and of course, Moses, being the mediator of the first covenant, is reckoned in the New Testament as the anticipation of, of course, the great mediator, who would ultimately be the mediator between God and man. <clears throat> and so Moses, in a sense, gives us a picture of one who goes up and comes back representing the shuttle diplomacy between a deity and humanity. The representation of our interests to God is called the priestly function. The representation of God's interest uh, to us is called prophetic function. <clears throat> so Moses is playing both roles here. He's a prophet and priest. He's going back and forth. Jesus, of course, is known to us as a prophet priest. Uh, and then the fact that he can unite those two ultimately makes him also what? It makes him a king, right? And so uh, that's what we call the minus triplets. Tripl triplex. That's a term that, of course, John Calvin coined as he sighed to draw together the three great offices of Jesus. You know, he's a priest, he's a prophet, and he's a king. Two of them, at least what we see anticipated here in the work of Moses, is what he is doing. You know, the prophetic and the priestly role goes back and forth, goes up and down. You know, he goes up and down that mountain and obviously he's getting his aerobic exercise I'm sure as he's doing so you would say the house of Jacob tell the Israelites it would you have seen what I did to the Egyptians how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself at this point God is instructing Moses uh, to rehearse briefly the great advantage is and there's a great benefit that has already been conferred upon them you know they've been rescued uh, this is the notion of being carried on eagles' wings is a favorite of the Old Testament. And even in the book of Revelation, it picks it up in chapter 12, where we find that God's people are carried, as it were, on eagles' wings into the, into the wilderness. And there's clearly an allusion to the same situation in the Old Testament, where they're carried away and rescued from peril in a kind of supernatural way. And the notion of eagles' wings is supposed to convey to us. What is it? We're also supposed to learn from this. This is exactly what's happened to us, that we've been rescued and carried away on eagle's wings from that which imperils us. This is the point that God is going to ask these people for their decision. But notice, he doesn't ask for their decision until he's already rescued them. He's already reached into Egypt. He miraculously has already pulled them out. He's already split the sea. He's already provided for them, he's already healed, and he's ready to open their eyes, or he's already opened their eyes. And he says, will you have me as your God? And at this point, it's their decision. Jesus said, for example, no one can see the kingdom, no one can enter the kingdom unless they are born again, unless they are carried on eagle's wings away from the, 
the garbage that would blind and enslave them and prevent them from recognizing who I am. So they're in a sense in which God's grace has already prevailed and brought them now to Sinai, where they are given the opportunity, as they certainly will, to say yes to this. And so there is always a yes. There's always a decision. But it's a decision that's made because of what God has what? What he's already done. We love him because he first loved us. And so this great proposal they have, but they have to be reminded. They've been carried on eagle's wings from the land of Egypt, you know, out of this place. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians. In verse 5 it says, Now therefore, if you will hear my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words used to speak to the Israelites. I've given you this little picture before, but if we look at the Old Testament, we would say, well, say this is Christ. This is the beginning of the New Testament era on a timeline. If we go way back to Genesis, we have the covenant that God made to Abraham. And we see that that covenant is kind of an overreaching covenant that runs all the way through and uh, accumulates in the promises made to Abraham and his seed, who Paul tells us in a narrow sense is Christ. Paul says in Galatians, he doesn't say <coughs> uh, to seeds of many, but to the one who is Christ. We are the seed of Abraham. Derivatively, by virtue of being in Christ by faith, we can all call ourselves the seed of Abraham, by virtue of being in Christ and united with him. All right, so you have a separate covenant that's made here with Moses. Not unrelated, but it's here. And this one also continues. And this one also accumulates with Christ. There are other covenants in the Old Testament, but these two seem to be the dominant ones. The ancient view of the people of God was that the covenant to Abraham was realized in the promises made to Moses. And that was an older view. And that was the Jewish view. And it continues to be the Jewish view to this very day. That that covenant, the promise made to Abraham, was realized. And then the promise to Moses uh, and in a sense, the one absorbed was absorbed into the other one. The New Testament, though, actually rejects that. Paul says in Galatians, the covenant with Moses, which came 430 years after the covenant with Abraham, did not abrogate that covenant. And that, in a sense, they both continue together and running in parallel. And they both reach the moment when it was fully realized in Christ. The difference between the two is important because the covenant with Abraham is a covenant of pure grace. Blessing. I will bless you. It's a unilateral because God could swear by no other. He swore by himself on these things. And if we look at the book of Hebrews, uh, Abraham in that great moment that this covenant was transactive, Abraham is passive. You remember the text in Genesis 15. This is uh, when the, the covenant is cut and Abraham brings these animals and you recall the story. Abraham was put into a deep sleep and God himself comes and passes through those animals. The Near Eastern Covenant pitcher would ordinarily have had the both parties uh, wading through the blood and guts of those animals. You know, and I know it's kind of gross, but in that case, Abraham was sleeping. He's passive. God says he swears by himself not by any other, not any other conditions. I will do these things. And Abraham is simply the, recip the recipient of a gracious, gracious promise. It, you'll notice though that the covenant with Moses is, di is different. This is called a covenant, a blessing, and a curse. And you see the blessing and curse motif, motif in Leviticus uh, chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 28. You know, and it says there, if you obey, then you'll be blessed in this city blessed in the country, blessed in this, blessed in that, you know, blessed that your kids will have won the Super Bowl, you know, all these things will happen, it's a wonderful blah blah blah, and if you, but then it goes on, it says, if you disobey, you'll be cursed, you'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the country, you'll lose the Super Bowl, and it'll be awful, so you have a cement, uh, symmetry there that is almost humorous in sort of a way, 
but you have this symmetry like one against the other like mirror images of the two blessing and curse you have none of that with Abraham <clears throat> and yet it's con significantly conspicuous in the case of Moses so why is that important because even though these great promises are made they are ultimately forfeited the promises of Abraham though are never forfeited the promises that God made to the people of Israel through Moses were forfeited they were forfeited when Jesus pronounced judgment against them during the Holy Week <clears throat> in which uh, you know he made these pronouncements of sentence against the Jewish people you would call that from the Gospels so we need to keep this in mind but having said that let's look at the details that we have here now the first promise that God is making to these people is that they will be distinct among the peoples of the world that you will be my treasured possession you're going to have this remarkable privilege you know and in Hosea we hear all of you all the families of the earth and I know you see this as a unique status now you're going to be temptation of what we hear in the text <sighs> to think that God is just in a sense playing favorites and taking one family for whatever reasons and give them these incredible benefits and the rest of the world is ignored but then we read the entire statement and we realize that it's not all what's going on here God has rather chosen this people made them his treasured possession precisely because he cares about the rest of the world and it's not unique private possession for them alone but it is something that God is doing for them so that they can do for others they are blessed to be a blessing and so the reminder of that is in this text today you should be my treasured possession possession out of all the peoples indeed the whole earth is mine as if to say my ownership of the whole earth is not limited by this statement so I'm choosing you then for some kind of unique status with reference to the rest of the world and what are those things well first you'll be a priest and a king and a holy nation a priestly kingly and holy nation the translation here says priestly kingdom it's translated variously um, there are various renderings of that even in this translation you have it can be sometimes read the kingdom of priests uh, the priests and kings or a priestly kingdom or some such thing but all of it's supposed to emphasize the idea <clears throat> of being kings on the one hand and priests on the other and finally of course to be holy these are the things that you see so let's look at it says here so what does it mean to be a priest so a priest is like I guess a pastor we appreciate that we have pastors pastors are the people who lead us in worship and uh, guide us in our understanding of the things of God encourage us uh, corrects us when we go astray in a sense they stand between us and God not preventing access to God but representing God to us and the sermons and the council and the prayers they all have this kind of priestly capacity that they're they're performing and we're definitely happy to have them aren't we the idea comes home when you're in that situation and tears are in your eyes you know you're feeling pain and there's a person who's beside you they're standing there beside you that's the pastoral role and we all deeply appreciate it because everyone knows I'm I'm sure uh, something of what I'm describing God has ordained that we should have pastors in the Old Testament and he ordained that this nation should be should be a pastor nation not keeping itself to some sort of private privilege but enjoying the privilege precisely because there were nations around them that obviously needed them in a pastoral capacity so you will be preached you'll be pastors you'll be a pastor nation hence here in the Old Testament that temple in Jerusalem would be a house of prayer to the nations and not just for you and the idea rarely happened with the idea in the Old Testament that all the nations would come and pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship the one true God you know they didn't all become Jews uh, there was no requirement of the nations that would be proselyted but they were to be pastored and there was a kindly priestly capacity here so they were also 
um, to be kingly. The kingliness of Israel of the Old Testament was not a kingliness of political authority. But I think it would be better stated that the kingliness uh, would be that of a moral authority. God entrusted these people with his very oracles. Paul says they're asking the questions in Romans there, chapter 3, what is the great advantage to being a Jew? He's just kind of knocked the props out from under what many people thought were the advantages of being a Jew, and then he asked the question, so what's left? What's the great advantage of being a Jew? And then we see in Romans 3, 1, he says the great advantages, there are great advantages in many ways. Primarily, to them, was entrusted the oracles of God. And that's what's happening right there. Uh, they were entrusted <coughs> um, to these people, the most profound, the most insightful, the most progressive, and the most enlightened system, for example, of civil justice, of governmental theory, of moral law, that the world would ever see or ever see again. And that's this great treasure that God had entrusted to his people. Jesus didn't come along to abrogate the law. Uh, he fulfills it. He raises the bar, but he never changes that and says, oh, I'll get rid of this. He says the law was fulfilled in him. And that this great treasure, that's a trust of them, became a shining light throughout the ancient world. You compare this to, for example, the, the Code of Hammurabi, or Solong, or Numa, to these great lawgivers who were celebrated in the ancient world, and they don't even come close to this. That's a given. Isaiah tells us in the first chapter of Isaiah, the law will flow through or flow forth from Zion. And there's a sense, there's this great moral authority that God entrusted to his people so that the nations ideally would look to them for guidance, for life. Now this rarely happened, we understand in the Old Testament, that this was the actual idea that was trying to be conveyed here. They were going to be called a holy nation. They were a holy nation in a sense that they lived by a higher standard to the holy means uh, as being set apart from the rest of the world. The Hebrew word Kadesh there means to set apart. They're going to live by a standard that will distinguish them among the peoples of the ancient world. They were all these regulations that come from that and that seems to be kind of trivial from our point of view. You can trim, you know, you can only trim your bread in a certain way. You can't mix this with that uh, into one garment, for example. And we look at these things and we think, what a bunch of cultic taboos almost, uh, rather than a divine revelation. But we find as we look at it, that what God is giving here is that he's specifically distinguishing these people. You know, with dietary regulations, circumcision, and all these things that are incumbent upon them, but we're told that they have to export all these to the world. Or sorry, they are never told that they have to export these to the, to the rest of the world. Even when Jonah, for example, went to Nineveh, he didn't preach to them and say, okay, everybody's got to go kosher. What did he say? He said, you need to repent. And I, so this is my point, I guess, that the pastor nation lives by a higher standard. They're distinguished in that regard. They have a priestly role. The pastoral role is a kingly role as well. And it's intended to benefit the rest of the world. And as we were saying earlier, this is the covenant which God makes with his people. What we find and survey the Old Testament is that the people of God rarely perform this duty very well at times. You know, they do better at other times, uh, but we certainly see moments when this kind of great shining beacon of light uh, from under Solomon, for example, or David. But especially towards the end, we begin to find increasingly people coming, speaking for God, prophets who are critiquing them. You know, you're turning your back on God and of this covenant. You're abandoning the covenant of your husband. And these people, or sorry, these prophets uh, come and warn them that they need to repent or judgment will come. So this is the, you know, the blessing slash curse that's being referred to. And you know, the, the major prophets and the minor prophets, they all kind of beat as one drum. They keep be beating, warning these people about their disobedience. But the message largely goes unheard. You know, I know I'm oversimplifying this here, 
Uh, but finally, the greatest of all prophets come. You know, Jesus comes and he goes to Jerusalem. He goes to Jerusalem as the judge. He enters the city triumphantly on a donkey. He goes to the temple, inspects the temple, doesn't like what he sees, chases out all of these simple money-grabbing people that were there in the temple. And he says, you know, you turned it into a den of thieves. Then he comes back on the Tuesday and pronounces his judgment upon it. He says to them, the stone that the builders rejected had become the chief cornerstone. And it's a marvelous thing in our eyes, as we look back, of course, alluding to himself, the stone that's being rejected by these particular Jewish leaders. He says, because you've killed the prophets and because you're going to kill the very son who came to give you this warning. The kingdom is taken from you and given to others. Remember, that's all what's happening on Tuesday of uh, <clears throat> Holy Week. And it's taken from you and given to others. This is God's sentence against Israel. Hundreds of years later, after they have finally failed and been given so many chances to repent. You know, they breached the covenant. They found themselves under the curse side of the covenant of Moses. Now, if you'll just bear with me here, I'd just like to refer to 1 Peter. And Peter was there when Jesus made these pronouncements of judgment. You know, Peter was there. He's writing this later, probably in the mid-60s AD, but he's remembering it as if it were yesterday. Jesus pronouncing these judgments against the Jewish leadership, or the religious leadership, that had become so corrupted. And it reminds his audience, and it's in these words, so I'm reading from uh, Peter's first uh, uh, letter and first Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 4 so let's take a look at this Peter says come to him a living stone Jesus is a living stone that we've talked about that he's a chief cornerstone of a new temple which is a living temple an organic temple a living stone Though rejected by men, Jesus was rejected by men, yet chosen precious in God's sight. And Peter continues living like stones, like living stones. Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. So Christ is a cornerstone of a new house, a new temple. Because the temple in Jerusalem, not one stone would be left upon in the other. And it's going to be set aside. A new temple is now taking its place. And these are living stones. Those living stones are, namely, you and me. To be what? To be a holy priesthood, priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. So in Peter's mind, what he's saying is that we're now part of a temple composed of living stones. Sacrifices are being offered, but of course the sacrifices offered here are not animal sacrifices, nor are they sacrifices of atonement, but they are sacrifices of consecration. Paul says, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. These living stones, the bodies of ours, are the very thing we sacrifice to God daily as we live out our lives in devotion to him. So that's the sacrifices in this temple, and that's what it stands for in the scripture. I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then, who believe, he is precious. But to those who did not believe, to those who rejected Christ, the stone the builders rejected became the very hidden cornerstone, a stone that makes them stumble, a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey as they were destined to do. Peter is agreeing now with God's great judgment that's pronounced against the people that has been connected to God under Moses and had failed and rejected Christ as their source of salvation. Now, listen to what Peter says. He's likely thinking of Exodus chapter 19, possibly when he's writing this. But he says, you're a chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the acts of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Anybody reading this who's familiar with the Old Testament would you know, likely identify what Peter's saying here is a reinstatement of what was said by Moses to the people of God uh, out in Sinai. But now, of course, this instruction, this description of what is being addressed, not to the people who've gone under Moses, but to this new covenant. 
people of God under Christ. You are a chosen priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are now a kingdom of priests. And the New Testament, of course, repeats this theme over and over and over again. So in a sense, what we're saying is that this is happening is also being realized. But it's not being realized in a sense of the Jewish state or something like that. It's being realized in the true seed of Abraham. Those who are connected to Christ by faith and all these promises are given to them in the Old Testament. Now devoid, <coughs> or sorry, now devolved to this true Israel, uh, the true seed of Abraham, that happens to be sports fans, you know, you and myself. We are the ones who are enjoying the rich privilege and responsibility. Now, we do have this responsibility. We are the ones who are priests in this world. We are the ones who are kings in this world. We are the ones who are supposed to represent the holy nation in this world. And whatever was true for these folks is even more in coming upon us now in the New Testament we see. So, we need to read this text and Exodus realizing <clears throat> that it's a lens through which we can see ourselves. You know, we're not into the covenant of Moses, but we're certainly under that which Moses anticipated and was richly realized <clears throat> in the fulfillment of Christ. But the status that was described by Moses devolves us into a new covenant regime. I kind of hope that makes sense. It, it seems to me that the text in Exodus has to be seen in light of the New Testament. So I've taken a little extra time to talk about that, but let's go ahead on to verse 7. So Moses came to the elders of the people who said all to them the words that the Lord had commanded to them, the people answered this one, everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. God has proposed, and guess what? They have said yes. <clears throat> now lawyers know that the offer and acceptance makes a contract. This is an offer of acceptance. And they do it pretty nonchalantly or pretty easily. They don't say, uh, hey, let's see, hmm, fine. Let's see the prime, uh, the fine print. You know, how many commandments are there going to be? They seem to be almost a little too enthusiastic here, but for this sake, let's give them a break. They're filled with wonder at this moment, and so they say yes. And that's what begins to create this new covenant. Moses reported these words to the people to the Lord. So Moses now has gone up the mountain, down the mountain, back up the mountain. And then the Lord says to Moses, I'm going to come down in a dense cloud in order that these people may hear when I speak to you. And so, trust you ever after distinguishing Moses. Now, this is in a special role that makes him the object of their confidence because God is speaking through him. And of course, to this day, we look back to Moses as this great prophet of God, this friend of God. Alright, let's look at the next paragraph. When Moses told the, world's, the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go and tell the people to consecrate themselves, to consecrate them today and tomorrow, have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day. Because on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai and all the sight of the people, and you shall set limits for the people around, saying, be careful not to go up to them on the mountain or touch it, the edge of it. And if you touch the mountain, you shall be put to death. No hand shall touch them. Apparently, the ones who were being put to death, they were to be stoned or shot with arrows. Uh, whether animal or living being or human being, they shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they presumably that Moses and Aaron should go up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He consecrated the people and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, prepare for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Now that's interesting. This is a fast. This is a fast of preparation. Uh, it doesn't say so, but it might even be a fast from food. It was a fast from intimate marital relations. It was a time of preparation. It was a time of washing oneself externally. And hopefully that would be, you know, sort of reach an uh, internal level of washing as well. Fairly self-explanatory, this is a warning not to touch the mountain, it's a holy place, and there's an awesomeness about it, and so that the people would be protected, who would, you know, maybe in curiosity, break through and do so and risk their lives. 
So let's go on and take the next paragraph, beginning of verse 16. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. You know, I, maybe it was Gabriel blasting the, the horn, who knows. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. And the smoke went up like fire of a kiln till the whole mountain shook violently and the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Now, I just want to comment here on that that's pretty dramatic stuff that's happening here and it would be a pretty scary place to be you just see this awesome display of god's power this deafening sound of a trumpet the shaking the smoke the fire it's amazing isn't it and i was impressed with the number of commentators who actually felt uh, they had to defend god putting on such a show why did god have to do all this extraordinary stuff you know, the common view of the commentators here, I think, and it's the correct, that these people, though they have been borne up on eagle's wings out of Egypt, and though they've been rescued, and God's poured out his great mercies upon them, they're still pretty unsophisticated in the understandings of the ways of God. They have not had, you know, years of experience. They've been slaves uh, <clears throat> one, for, you know, at least just over 100 years before, more or less. Uh, when they were cut off from their homeland. And who knows how fuzzy their theological understanding had become at that point. And it's almost as if you were, you had to deal with a child by just making this big loud crash, uh, banging noise, like a sing symbol to get the child's attention. And in a sense, you almost get the feeling here that God is just, you know, essentially clashing these symbols together to get their attention to say, hey, you know, leaving this lasting impression on them because at this point, well, I think a lot of the subtlety would have been lost on them. It's just kind of turn the bright lights on, make great noises, and hey, I need to get your attention. Doesn't say that quite in the text, but you know, to me it makes sense having been a father, and some of you know what I'm talking about, sometimes you just have to do things to get your children's attention. But notice, as the Old Testament drama unfolds, how again and again and again it moves from this bombast or um, display to more of a greater subtlety. My favorite illustration is that of Elijah. Elijah is, you know, the first prophet that God brings out of the period of the kings. And Elijah is chosen and he's given a great miracle working power. You recall he does some pr pretty spectacular stuff. But there's kind of the critical moment in his career when he goes up on top of Mount Carmel and, you know, kills the prophets of Baal and Astaroth after being vindicated when fire comes down from the sky. And I think we all remember that great event. And of course, right after this wonderful moment of victory, he hears Jezebel is out to get him. And what does he do? He immediately heads south. And he went to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, which is exactly where Moses is with the people of God right now here on Horeb, the mountain of God. And Elijah says, you went up in the, and it says that Elijah went up on the mountain and hid in a cave. And while he's there in that cave, the word of God comes to him. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah goes to the mouth of the cave and he lo looks out at the mountains surrounding him and he sees a display of what would be similar to what we have described here. He sees earthquakes, he sees fire, he sees no wind uh, that rents the rocks. He sees these incredible displays of God's power, and then we have something very expect unexpected. You know, this still small voice comes next. But he doesn't hear about all these things in all the great displays of God's power. God was not into them. Interesting. All these powerful displays, God is not in them. He hears a still small voice. And that's where God's truth is disclosed. And it's even if Elijah had begun realizing that God really speaks to us not too much, not so much in a bombast way, but through the subtleties of that inner hearing of the word, a heart that is disposed to accept the truth. God rarely comes to us and knocks us upside of the head, you know, 
He's now sometimes he does, but he usually doesn't do that, does he? That's not his preferred method. He wants to speak to us in a more quiet, subtle way. Jesus, when he's born, he's born in a barn of peasant parents in a little town, grows up in obscurity, lives a fairly um, simple life by the standards, you know, a modest life for a guy who's the king of the universe. Not a very impressive life. All of this to say that we'll, while we have this miraculous display of God's power at this point, really God is heading towards a redemption that reaches down deep inside of us, that we need to be those who hear him in a still small voice. Now I don't want to lapse into subjectivism here, uh, but we need to hear the still small voice through the scriptures, you know. But nevertheless, that's how God speaks to us, isn't it? Even though we have this miraculous display of power at Sinai, we realize that that is not the norm. In the New Testament, we have Sinai compared to that great city. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12, we're coming to this city that we see with what? The eyes of faith. <clears throat> and this is the place where we finally realize the great redemption that we have in Christ. So even though we can be quite impressed with things, I think we need to realize that there's a reason for that at that time hadn't necessarily been the style of people the style of the people of God or the style of God in history on an ongoing basis uh, we haven't quite done justice to chapter 9 and I don't think we would so I'm going to come back next time and pick up and tie up a few loose ends and then we'll get into chapter 20 <clears throat> now let's close in a word of prayer God in heaven we're deeply grateful we know that none of us has gotten the right answer uh, fully. And we pray that our conversation today uh, will, insp uh, will not inspire any kind of negative thoughts or animosity, certainly, but simply to generate a loving appreciation of, you know, that you are the God of history and that you are doing what you want in history. Uh, this is our unspeakable privilege to be part of it and we pray that we might play our roles out faithfully trusting you and seeing your hand in our lives in the way that brings glory to you jesus we give thanks for all this in the name of jesus amen